Here is Scott George, who's going to speak to us about long-term trends in naturalized and real life crop populations in the upper Rosatis Creek Catskill Mountains. <laughs> Jim, thanks everyone. Uh, we made the, the brave choice to choose me over Sturgeon. I hope we don't let you down here. Uh, quickly, uh, uh, quickly, I should acknowledge uh, my co authors, uh, Barry Baldigo with the USGS, Mike Flaherty with the DEC Region 3, and uh, I mean Randall uh, with Ecologic and, uh, and Cornell, uh, and then also our cooperators who made the research possible the Shogun Watershed Street Manager Program. Cornell Cooperative Extension of Ulster County, uh, New York City DEP, the USGS, MySERDA, and DEC. Uh, and as Jim mentioned, my talk is looking at long term trends in rainbow travel abundance and growth in a complex uh, river reservoir system in the Catskill Mountains. And taking a look at that uh, study area is probably the easiest way to start here if you're not too familiar with the Catskills. Uh, the Upper Sophus Creek Basin is shown right here on the inset. Uh, here's obviously the linear watershed, and it drains into the Shokin Reservoir here, which was built in 1915 as part of the New York City drinking water supply system. And you know, the research I'm presenting today is seeking to uh, synthesize a stream electric fishing surveys, um, looking at population density and biomass at a handful of sites here in the stream, and combine that with uh, the results of aging and back calculation um, of length and age uh, for rainbow trout adults. In the reservoir. So, a quick history. Uh, like most parts of the Catskills, uh, the Sophus Creek, in particular its tributaries, were historically brook trout water. And uh, Ed Van Putt wrote a fascinating book, uh, Trout Fishing in the Catskills. Uh, the Catskills are near and dear to you. It's, a, it's an awesome book if you haven't seen it. But what's noteworthy in it is he really dug into the primary literature in the uh, early newspapers and the early sportsmen who went to tributaries to the Asopus, say the 1830s, 40s, 50s, it was common for them to catch over 100 <coughs> brook trout in a single fly fishing outing. Um, and angling parties, groups of people, you know, that would camp out at some of the remote locations routinely would remove over 1,000 brook trout just in, you know, a couple day period. And the, the newspapers would report on these and actually fostered somewhat of a, you know, competitive uh, you know, angling environment. And of course, all the fish were salted and preserved and, you know, brought back for consumption. And this, I guess, gross exploitation combined with the development of streamside industry, uh, particularly the tanneries um, and the, the sawmills, really denuded the riparian zone and you ended up with extensive erosion, increased stream temperatures, and actually uh, you know, polluted waters uh, from the tanning as well. So by the time you get to the 1860s and 70s, uh, brook trout angling has deteriorated, again, a combination of exploitation and uh, environmental degradation. And that led uh, the early sportsmen um, and early resource managers to explore other options. Uh, Seth Green, the uh, father of the modern day uh, hatchery system, provided one of those options uh, for us, which was the California mountain trout, or as we know it, the uh, rainbow trout, I think it's like this, which was first stocked uh, into tributaries of the Asopus in 1883. Unlike other uh, parts of the Catskills where rainbow trout didn't take particularly well, um, they were pretty happy in the Asopus and they, they thrive both in the warmer waters of the Asopus that maybe never supported great brook trout fishing and also um, obviously encroached on some of the brook trout habitat as well. Uh, we all know the narrative. Uh, and then the Ashokan Reservoir is built in 1915, which now complicates the system and provides a large lentic environment that really allowed individual uh, adult rainbow trout to reach uh, you know, sizes that we just had not seen previously. And of course, this really led to a great wild fishery. Stocking was discontinued. Um, in the 1950s, and of course that was the end of the story. I probably wouldn't be here talking to you today. So more recently, we have a hodgepodge of both anecdotal and biological data that suggests uh, we're seeing a decline. Uh, USGS has electric fishing data for, annually for nine sites, uh, just from 2009 through 2014, um, that show a, a decline just during that period in density of biomass. DEC Region 3, um, Bob Engel and Mike Flaherty uh, were kind enough to share field netting data with me that suggests about 90% decline in catch per net night in the reservoir of adult rainbow trout. Um, again, I mean, they're not able to get out there every year, so it's still somewhat patchy. And anglers, 
you know, we, we all know that we think the fishing was better then than it is now, and you know, the anglers in this watershed are, are no different, but you know, they do make some compelling points and you know, argue that they're seeing emaciated looking fish in the reservoir that maybe they haven't seen before. Uh, this is fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. Perfect. Um, yeah. Uh, combine the angler report with the fact that alewife were established into the reservoir in the 1970s. White perch got in about 10 years ago, around 2006. And as a result, we're putting together a handful of hypotheses. I mean, anytime you have a declining population, recruitment is probably the first thing you want to look at. And we know that the life history of our rainbow trout is such that most of them are spawning either in the Asopus or its tributaries, at least we believe that to be the case. Um, and secondly, um, the reports of the emaciated looking fish and the introduction of these invasive species have prompted an interesting hypothesis. Are we actually seeing reduced growth or fitness of the large adults, which really comprise the spawning stock in the reservoir, which ultimately could have uh, you know, reduced uh, recruitment? We know that both alewife and white perch are very prolific planktivores. Uh, there's a number of studies that show when they get into a new water body, they crop out the large daphnids very effectively. And rainbow trout, of course, uh, you know, eat a lot of large zooplankton, so presumably there could be negative competitive uh, interactions occurring in the reservoir. So we tried to get at this two different ways. We were able to continue quantitative electrofishing surveys at uh, six of our stream sites. So we have now a continuous record for seven years, which really still isn't adequate to get at, I guess, the aspects of a historical decline, but you have to start somewhere. And uh, we also, uh, DEC Region 3, had this amazing archive of uh, scale samples dating back to 1952 uh, from adult rainbow trout from the reservoir. So that gave us a really unique opportunity to try to assess the growth of both pre and post alewife introduction and pre and post white perch introduction. And uh, we contracted with uh, Ecologic, and Eileen Randall was kind enough to spend uh, copious hours uh, under the scope uh, trying to aid to do Fraser Lee uh, back calculations of length at age. So we'll start in the stream. <coughs> I've got here on the y axis density of rainbow trout in terms of fish per 10 hectare or fish per uh, 1,000 square meters. And each of these black dots is showing you the average of our six sites in a given year. And you can see 2009, 2010, um, you know, our density is you know, moderate and stable. Wow. <laughs> Um, <laughs> as we get into 2011 through 2014, um, density crashes and really stays down. And again, this is the average of all six of our sites, not to say that every single one of them was, was bad looking, but across the board we saw declines. Of course, we knew this. This wasn't really new data. What is new is the 2015 and 16 results uh, where we see density come back up and you know, more or less stabilize, at least over a two-year period. Density, we know, is completely largely a function of your year class that year, the young of the year dominant numerically. So we pull in biomass now to get a more, I guess, complete picture. And you can see it's somewhat different initially, where we start um, fairly low. We actually peak in 2012, albeit with enormous <coughs> error bars, which are a function of a couple large fish that we picked up at you know, one or two individual sites. But by 13 and 14, we're seeing very low biomass and very low density, which of course suggests we're kind of in a rough place, both in terms of abundance and biomass. But 2015 and 16, uh, biomass comes up to a moderate level and appears stable for at least two seasons. Now, we can get at the recruitment question maybe more directly by looking at a series of length frequency distributions. It's probably more appropriate to look at each site individually. For convenience here, I have them all lumped together. So these are, I guess you call them cumulative, all six sites, all the rainbow trout captured across those six sites are lumped together here. They're length frequency distribution, so I have the number of rainbow trout here uh, on the y-axis and the specific length categories here um, on the x-axis. And you can see 2009, 2010, we had strong recruitment, really good year classes. So young of the year, we're out there largely in July, so we would define our young of the year cut off probably around 90 uh, millimeters. And a decent number of yearlings here as well. And we get into this dark period where by 2013 and 14, recruitment is poor, and even the numbers of yearlings are down, which is why we see our biomass start to crash around that period. But positive news, 2015, 2016, we're starting to see um, you know, pretty nice year classes, and our biomass, of course, is reflecting a greater number of yearlings that we're seeing as well. So what can we take from this quick snapshot of the stream? I guess you know, studying stream fish populations is, is 
exceptionally difficult, right? They're highly variable, they're regulated by abiotic and biotic factors, and uh, to understand truly what's driving the you know, year class size is you know, a real mess of uh, you know, confounding variables. But what we think we're seeing, at least in our seven year data set here, represents a series of hydrologic events um, and then ultimately a recovery following that. So we had drought in late 2010 that came after the 2010 surveys were completed. And we had a flood in late 2010, a flood in early 2011. And then, of course, everyone knows Irene, August 2011. And then following Irene, we had this bizarre phenomenon where the brown trout, uh, which spawned a couple months after Irene, spawned incredibly successfully. We had an enormous year class of brown trout in 2012, really unlike anything we had seen. And the literature tells us that when the fall spawners have a great year class, those young of the year generally outcompete the young of the year of the spring spawners if all else equal. So ultimately, it looks like a series of events uh, strung together may have uh, temporarily knocked back rainbow trout populations. But in the last two years, we're seeing fairly high and stable estimates of density and biomass, which indicates we're getting good recruitment. And we're at least seeing decent survival to the yearling um, stage, for sure. So, Fun, well, I don't know if it's fun or not, but the interesting question, um, 2017 and 2018, we're going to be back out replicating these surveys, and one thing that will really be of interest is the effects of the 2016 drought. And I imagine wherever you were in New York State, you must have felt the effects of this. The Catskills, I believe, were hit uh, particularly hard. This is uh, just a basic hydrograph from our USGS gauge at Alvin on the main stem of the Esopus, just upstream of where the Shandaken Tunnel comes in. And, of course, standard... Uh, Hydrograph here, discharge at cubic feet per second. And these orange triangles here, they're showing us a median daily statistic from a 52 year period of record. In other words, where we, we should be based on historical records. And you can see through the summer, we're bouncing around. We're not too woefully behind where we should be. But as you get into September, and in particular October, um, you know, the median statistics says we should be going up, and reality says we're going down, and we end up, you know, Sometime mid October, we're at about 7 CFS, and we should be what, in the neighborhood of 40, 45, 50. So, this is interesting for two reasons that I think could have maybe conflicting effects on the rainbow trout population. On the one hand, we had a great year class in 2016. How well did those young of the year survive during these stressful conditions? We don't know. On the other hand, this severe drought occurs as brown trout are preparing to and starting to spawn in the watershed. Um, Brown trout, we're just speculating, may have really had a rough go of it spawning this year, which actually prompted DEC to close a large portion of the stream to angling, which was fairly unprecedented. Um, if brown trout did, in fact, have a fairly unsuccessful um, spawn this past fall, um, we may see the rainbow trout, so they're young of the year, find a lot of habitat and resources uh, available to them that normally they'd be competing for. So, um, again, all speculation, but interesting to talk about. On the interest of time, we're going to forge ahead and we'll look at growth of adult rainbow trout in the Ashokan Reservoir. So these larger adults represent what we believe are probably a significant portion of the spawning stock for the entire watershed. So again, we have scale samples of about 500 fish from 1952 uh, to 2016. And we've lumped them just into three course categories, pre ale life, which is 1952 to about 1975, depending on what basin. Um, and post ale life is 1975, approximately 2006, and then post white perch is 2006 and on. So we've lumped all this data um, into a series of von Ortolanffy growth curves shown here. So we have the age of fish on the x axis um, and the length of the fish corresponding um, to, I guess, its January 1st imaginary birthday um, you know, related to that age. And the black dots and the black growth curve correspond to the pre ale life period. That's the oldest data. The gray dots and the gray curve are related to the post ale life period. And the hollow dots and the dashed line relate to the post white perch period. That's the most recent data. And of course, what you're looking for is you want to know is length at age different um, in successive periods? And you know, are our growth curves looking different? And, you know, at first glance, you the pre l life and post l life curves look pretty similar. They actually are statistically different if you use an extra sum of squares test, but, you know, realistically, they're, they're fairly similar. What's striking here is that the post-white perch period, especially in these middle years, look very, very different. Um, and two really important caveats here, and we're still kind of sorting through the implications of this, this figure. 
you see the white perch graph suggests that life at age greater through age four or so, and then starts to level off towards some kind of length asymptote more quickly. This may not be real. Um, there is very little data here in the age five and six, um, which is just a function of rainbow trout population in New York State. I mean, you're hard pressed, I think, to get six year olds, at least we are on the, the show pan. So, whether or not this leveling off is truly representative, I think, is questionable. And the same thing could be said for the pre LY period. The older data is not well represented either. Um, also, the life history of our fish is such that many of the rainbow trout are spending at least the first year of their life actually in the tributaries, and they tend to drop down as they're approaching age two. At least we have limited data suggesting that. Um, so therefore, this cluster, and to some extent this, may say as much about stream growth as they do actually about a reservoir. So what can we take from this? Um, it looks pretty clear that growth has not declined following each subsequent introduction. Um, secondly, if we lump all of our data together and compare the average length at age, say for an H2 fish, an H3 fish, an H4 fish, to that reported in Carlander from approximately 25 um, populations in North America primarily, we're pretty much spot on um, with where we should be relative to the average. So we're not seeing abnormally high or low growth. We look fairly typical. So this suggests, and again, speculation, that the, intro the introduction of these two invasive species are probably not directly responsible for the general declining population that we think we've seen in the watershed. Um, and that shifts focus back to recruitment issues. And I think this is good news because if the conclusion was that competition for forage um, you know, in the reservoir related to zooplankton was the limiting factor, and following these introductions, rainbow trout growth was crashing, which was affecting the fitness of the spawners, and so on and so forth, that would be a problem that would be pretty challenging to take any direct management action towards rectifying. If it turns out that our issues are more recruitment oriented and have to do with stream habitat, um, targeted management actions and watershed management practices may have a chance uh, at doing something. So I interpret these findings to be cautiously good news. Um, and related to recruitment issues, I guess one logical extension of where we are with this research now is it's probably time to at least think about uh, diamond levels. And this is something that we haven't really forayed into, but the reality is we have a reservoir full of alewife, we have large rainbow trout inhabiting that reservoir that presumably at some points um, are consuming small alewife. We know alewife are very high in thymonase, an enzyme that breaks down thymine levels uh, in the predators that consume them. And you know whether or not we're, we have a thymine deficient population at this moment, we don't know. But if we do, you know there could be experiencing early mortality syndrome um, in the trips, and we could be experiencing impaired migratory ability of adults like they see uh, in the Finger Lake. So again, total speculation, and if you're someone who has experience uh, with the five, and I'd love to chat with you later and uh, get up to speed on uh, crash course as to how you go about determining if your population is time efficient. Um, and with that, uh, I leave you with a, a beautiful <laughs> photo of the, the greats of Walt Keller. Yeah, I'm happy to field any questions. <laughs> <laughs>